I'm glad I'm saved. Amen. 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 Thank God the blood's been applied. The blood, you see, it still takes the blood. Yes. What can wash away my sins? Mm -hmm. Nothing but the blood. Yes. Hallelujah. We'll be in Galatians chapter 5. If you brought your Bibles tonight, we trust that you did. Galatians chapter 5. For those of you that have been with us, we are in a uh, series preaching through the epistle of the Apostle Paul to the Galatians. This is part number 24. 24 messages in this series. And we have gotten to the scripture in Galatians chapter 5 that speaks of the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. If you'd like to stand with us, please, as we reverence the reading of the Word of God, we're going to pick, off, pick up where we left last time, and may we look to God and trust Him to send us a word tonight, because we need a word from the Lord, don't we? Amen. Amen. It's very much needed. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 22, says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Amen. Bow in a moment's word of prayer. Father in heaven, please God, bless and move in this service. Lift this church up and may we lift you up above all. May we lift Christ above the chaos. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. God bless you. Uh, it, it's been a couple of weeks since we <coughs> talked about the fruit of the Spirit, so just by way of a very brief review tonight, we mentioned that a believer in Jesus Christ is to walk a life that is marked by the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. We ought to live a life that's sweet and juicy. Amen. But this list of things is called the fruit of the Spirit, because this is what the Spirit produces in the life of a child of God. We don't produce these things. It comes from the Spirit of God. And uh, this fruit comes within us by the Spirit of God. And this is that spiritual harvest that is appropriate to a new life who's put their faith, trust, and confidence in the Lord. So we have this fruit because... Uh, God is in the business of producing this fruit and it's top quality fruit and it's abundant and it's eternal. The believer has done nothing whatsoever to deserve it. We've done nothing to earn it, merit it. We can't purchase it in any way. This comes strictly as an act of, of uh, grace and mercy of God. So we mentioned last time that the word fruit is a collective noun. It's designating a crop or a harvest. That's what it's talking about. So uh, these qualities are personal, uh, social. They govern principles of conduct. And we pointed out that these are called the uh, fruit of the Spirit and not the works of the Spirit. Uh, Spirit, Because fruit cannot be bought. This fruit cannot be bought. It cannot be earned. It cannot be secured by human efforts. No matter, no matter how good you try to be, no matter how hard you try to toe the line, no matter how pious and religious you are, no matter uh, you know what kind of good person you try to you do right and live right and all like that, in and of yourself, my dear friend, you will fail to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. You can't produce the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit produces this fruit. Amen. So we covered these first three characteristics last time, and the first one was love. We told you it was the word agape. The source of agape love is always God. So as followers of Christ, we cannot truly have this agape love on display in our lives, whether it's directed toward God or, or anybody else, except it first stemmed from God. God is the source of this love. So if you have this love, it has to come from God. He's the source of it. Amen. So love is a part of this harvest. Uh, that comes in the Christian life. We also cover joy in the last message. Joy is a state of gladness. It's having cheerfulness. It's just being in a state of delight. So if you have joy in your life, you can thank God that God, through and by the Spirit, produced that joy in you. And I want to tell you tonight, if you don't have joy in your life, it's available to you. Amen. It's available to you in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And the joy that God gives is joy that you can have even in the midst of a bad situation. Amen. It's not something that just comes in briefly and then fleets away. But this joy is a lasting joy. Why? Well, I think about what James said it, over in the book of James. He said, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations knowing that the trying of your faith works patience tonight. God will use that trial in your life. God will use that situation, that tribulation that you're going through to work patience in your life. And you'll come out a better person not because of you, but because you are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, the Amen. Lord. Amen? We also talked about peace. The Holy Spirit, uh, Spirit produces peace in the life of the believer and you can live in harmony with God and you can live in harmony with other people because of the author of peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14 tells us that Christ is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Christ is the author of peace. And it's because of him that, that we can have harmony. I can have a peaceful mind. Uh, a peaceful mind can prevail because of Jesus. And, and this is not just talking about peace with other people, but you can have peace with God. Peace is available today between God and man and we can live in harmony with God and we can live in harmony with one another and we can be content in our lives because of what Jesus has done. Amen. God's the source of peace. He can put you at peace with Him. He can put you at peace with other people. Let me go on to say this. Uh, you know, if we want peace in this nation instead of conflict, we're going to have to look back to God. We're going to have to get our eyes Focused on the Lord and take them off of the temporal, take them off of the carnal, take them off of the temporary things that pass away in this life. I think about what Paul said in Colossians chapter 3 when he, when he said, Set your affection on things above. Yeah. Not on the carnal things that pass away in this life, but get your mind on Jesus. He's seated at the right hand of God tonight. So that brings us up to speed on this fruit of the Spirit. Now we're looking at long-suffering. Long-suffering. If you're taking notes tonight, long-suffering, it just simply means patience and forbearance. We have patience and we forbear one another. Uh, it, it, it speaks of a slowness. If someone does you wrong, you don't just jump and snap off in an instant and go out and try to avenge uh, that wrong that was done to you. Uh, amen? So if you are displaying long-suffering in your life, you're not going to just try to even the score quickly, but you're going to be patient. You're going to forbear. People uh, who are long-suffering in their life are people who will make every effort to give somebody the benefit of the doubt. Amen? So they'll forbear someone. They'll not be quick to jump to a conclusion. Long-suffering is a word that's used in the Bible to describe God Himself. God is a long-suffering God. Aren't you thankful for that, my dear friend? I don't know about you, but I sure am glad God could have, could have cast me into hell a long time ago and been perfectly just in doing so, but He's a long-suffering God. And He showed me grace tonight. In Romans 2 and 4 it says, uh, Or despisest thou the riches of His goodness and forbearance and long-suffering. Uh, know ye not that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Hallelujah. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, it's mentioned that long-suffering is a quality that a minister or a servant of God should possess. Go with me please to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Again reading in verse number 4. It says, But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, and fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, 
as dying, and behold, we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, and having as having nothing, yet possessing all things. But you'll remember that I told you that long-suffering means patience. But yet, look in verse number 4, and it says much patience. So, if long-suffering means patience, then why do we have the word patience in verse number 4? Well, you have to keep in mind, my dear friend, that we are dealing with a translation of some Greek manuscripts and these words that are translated long-suffering and, pa and patience in, in uh, this chapter are two different Greek words. They don't mean the same thing. So if the Holy Ghost inspired writer, which was the Apostle Paul who penned this down, had intended them to mean the same thing, he would have used the same Greek word in both places, but he didn't. He uses two different Greek words. And the word that's translated as patience in verse number 4, uh, it, 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 it speaks of a certain kind of patience. So it is patience, but it speaks of endurance. It speaks of having some constancy in your life. It also speaks of someone who's just wait, waiting patiently. Amen? Thank God. Look at this verse we've got up here. You've got to wait upon the Lord. Amen? For they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Yeah. Hallelujah. So we need to wait upon God. But getting back to long-suffering, Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, he said, With all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Hey, that's what we're trying to do right here at this church. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Long-suffering is something that the believer is commanded to put on. Paul commands the believer in Colossians chapter 3 to put on long-suffering. Paul also wrote to Timothy about Christ's long-suffering in 1 Timothy 1.16. He told Timothy, this is the very reason why I received mercy. And I'm just paraphrasing to you what Paul said to Timothy. It was so that Jesus might display His perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. So basically what Paul was saying to Timothy was this, despite all my wickedness, despite all of the evil that I committed, despite all the sins, despite me being the chief of all sinners, Jesus Christ was long-suffering toward me. Thank God I could say the same thing tonight. Despite all of the wickedness that I was involved in as a lost man apart from God, Jesus Christ was long-suffering toward me. Amen. And He was long-suffering towards you, my dear friend, if you're saved. Amen. That's what Paul said. Thank God I sure am glad that God is a long-suffering God, aren't you? Amen. Bless His worthy name. He could have cast me into hell, but He didn't. Why? Because He's long-suffering. And because of Him, the believer can have this attribute of long-suffering inside his or her life. We can be long-suffering one toward another. And I want you to understand this. Just because the Bible describes God as long-suffering, and just because long-suffering is a fruit of the Spirit for you, you and I, that don't mean that justice never comes. That's right. Amen? Oh no. You see, justice will still come. You can rest assured of that. The Bible said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, it talked about how that God was long-suffering in the days of Noah. Now, now think about it. I thought about this as we studied and prepared for this preaching tonight. God was long-suffering in the days of Noah. What happened in the days of Noah? Well, he was long-suffering while the ark was being prepared. That's what 1 Peter chapter 3 says. Once that ark was finished, there were eight souls who got on board that ark and they were saved, the Bible said, because they got on the ark. But the rest of humanity perished in the floodwaters. But that didn't happen until after a period of long-suffering on God's part. So you see, it's obvious tonight that the long-suffering of God, it benefited Noah and his family because they got on board the ark. God was long-suffering while the ark was preparing. They benefited from it. But you know, all of the rest of this wicked world benefited from the long-suffering of God in the sense that they were able to stand on this earth for another 120 years while Noah 
preached righteousness and Noah preached unto them the Word of God. So it doesn't mean that you condone what somebody's doing because you're long-suffering. So don't be afraid to be patient with somebody. Don't be afraid to forbear somebody. Uh, amen. Because if they have a pattern of sin in their life, that pattern will repeat itself and somewhere down the road there will be justice. Amen. Long-suffering is a part of the harvest of God and there is no law against long-suffering. Amen. So next we see on the list of the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. Gentleness. This just simply means showing kindness. It's actually translated as kindness in uh, 2 Corinthians 6 and 6. So someone who displays gentleness just shows goodness of heart in their life. They show moral goodness in general. It's the disposition just to treat people kindly. You ought to be kind. Amen. Now that's some good preaching right there. Amen. Uh, you know, people say, I want a practical sermon that I can apply to my life. Apply that. Apply a little bit of kindness. Amen. Christian, you ought to be kind yeah. to people. That's what gentleness is. Now perhaps we can better understand gentleness by looking at its opposites. A person showing gentleness will not just selfishly insist on, upon his or her own way. A person showing gentleness is not going to be arrogant. A person showing gentleness is not going to be rigid. They, they won't demand that they receive special rights. And they're not going to demand that you receive special justice. In your life, a person showing gentleness has a calm demeanor, a calm spirit. They're a reasonable person. I like reasonable people, don't you? Amen. Somebody with a caring spirit. That's somebody who shows gentleness. And, and, and that's what it means. That's the mark of a child of God. It's the mark of having some inner beauty in your life with God. And it's of great worth in the sight of God. So, gentleness. Be kind. Have you ever just met somebody who was hateful all the time? Had an old crabby demeanor? You know, went around with uh, just an old crabby temperament, temperamental, hateful, just hateful. You ever met anyone like that? Now, I'm not talking about the ones who seem crabby because you're not polite to them. I'm talking about people who are just crabby, just hateful all the time. I think we all know people like that. They need some of this gentleness in their life. They need to have a little bit of kindness in their life on display to help them out quite a bit. Because this is one of the regular effects of the Spirit's operation in the life of a child of God. If you have this on display, it's a good, good sign. It's good evidence you're bearing this fruit for God. The Spirit of God's at work on the inside of you. Why? Because you're a kind person. You're polite to people. Right. Amen? This is the exact same word that's translated kindness in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 12 where Paul wrote this. He said, Put on therefore as the elect of God, uh, holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving uh, one another. So we could see gentleness is kindness. To help us better understand what we're talking about, consider our God. God's kind, isn't it? Would you agree with that tonight, church? Amen. We serve a kind God. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad for that. He's a kind God. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 4 says He is. It says, But after that, the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. God is a kind God. Yeah. And showing this grace and this mercy to us. Also in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses number 6 and 7, it speaks of the kindness of God when it says this. It says, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Amen. So thank God. The Word of God bears it out. God is a kind God. Amen. I'm glad for that. 
these verses use the same word that's translated as gentleness in Galatians 5 and verse number 22. I'm so thankful that we have a God who is kind. And because God is kind, you and I who are believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ can have this fruit on display in our lives. Amen? Then we have goodness. Goodness just means being upright. You're upright in heart and life. That's goodness. Goodness, as I studied on these two words, it seems to be very close to gentleness, but it refers more to the characteristic of someone who is ready to do good. So it's speaking there of a readiness to do good. A person who shows goodness has a disposition to uh, show goodness to other people. So we could say it like this. If you are a, oh, I love this, this is just simple, cookies on the bottom shelf, everybody benefits from this. If you are a Christian man and you are showing goodness in your life, this fruit of the Spirit that we're talking to you about tonight, if you're a Christian man who's showing goodness, you ought to be a good man. Somebody ought to say man right there. If you're a Christian woman, you ought to be a good man. Oh, I can't do it, Pastor. With Jesus, you can. <clears throat> Amen. If you're a Christian boy or a girl or a teenager, you ought to be a good boy or a girl or a teenager. It's, it's possible in Him. We serve a good God. He shows goodness to His people. Amen. Would you agree with that? Has God shown goodness to you? Yes. Paul used the word goodness also in Romans 15 and 14 where the Bible says and I myself am also persuaded of you my brethren that ye are also full of goodness filled with all knowledge able also to admonish one another. And Paul also uses this word in his letter to the Ephesians again in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 8 through 10. Here's what it says. It says for you were sometimes darkness but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of, of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, same word, and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Amen. Isn't that good? Thank you, Lord. So we can see that this goodness, having a disposition, and being ready to be good to people is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. And there's no law against goodness. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful for that. <clears throat> And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. We're going to touch just very, very briefly on faith. Because it's right at the end of this verse. But we, we could go on preaching about faith from now till the Lord comes back. I mean, faith is a deep topic. So if you're taking notes, we don't want to just leave you hanging, get you right down to the end of the verse, and, and uh, just stop it right there before we tell you anything about faith. We did that once before and somebody called me. But faith. Faith. There's a lot we could say about it. This word that's translated as faith here in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. And I'm going to say this and then we're going to come to a close. This word that's translated faith here in this verse. Every time that it is used in the New Testament. It's always referring to faith in God or faith in Jesus Christ or having faith in some spiritual thing. Amen. That's what it always refers to. It's talking about a persuasion or a conviction that we have as, as believers in God upon, upon hearing. So you hear the Word of God. You believe that. You believe in some spiritual faith. A thing you have faith in. That's what this Word's talking about. And we need to have faith now more than ever. Would you agree? Amen. I mean, look around at this world we're living in. I'm glad we've got a God that we can trust in. And I believe, I believe God's going to move. I believe God's going to act. I believe God's going to keep every promise in this book. Yes. I believe Jesus is coming again. Amen. I've heard these things and I believe and, I, and I've been convicted that these things are true. And I've got faith. Yes. Faith. It's a fruit of the Spirit. There is no law against faith. Amen. We'll pick up next week and talk some more about faith next time.
you'll pray with us tonight, every head bowed, every eye closed, as Melissa comes to the piano. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we love you tonight. Lord, as your word has gone out, I pray God the Spirit of God will move in this congregation. Lord, stir some heart for Jesus, God, I pray. Lord, help us, God, to have a greater burden and desire to read and study your word and to pray and to witness for you and to let our lights so shine before men that men might see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. To you be the honor and glory now and forevermore, God, I pray. Help us, God, to be a church that glorifies and honors Christ and help us preach the gospel. Help us preach the true Word of God in the face of adversity, in the midst of persecution, and come what may in this life, God, direct our steps. Hold, hold us up by the right hand of Your righteousness. And may this world see and know that because of what You've done and what You're doing in our lives as individuals and the life of this church as a congregation, May they see and know that there is a God in heaven who is real. And there is a Savior in Jesus Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll ask you to stand if you're able tonight.